I'm Stefan Gura, and I'm one of the confounders of uh, Weave.ai, as Ruth uh, explained to you. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, the future of AI, and I think it's, it's about inter interactivity. And it's the least technical talk, <laughs> the talk that we, you will hear tonight. And I just want to convince you of two things. Um, that our computers and devices are barely interactive, and uh, computer interactivity is highly desirable and requires both a cultural shift and an AI-driven approach. We can fix interactivity, and AI is, is here to help us. Um, so this is AI, and uh, AI is, is beautiful. AI um, is um, elegant, and um, all the people who believe that uh, AI is a tool for the betterment of mankind uh, are a little bit like this, uh, like peacocks. We have beautiful ideas and we like to flaunt them. And why shouldn't we? Because, because AI is awesome. Uh, it can solve problems that humans can barely touch, like, like uh, uh, pathfinding, conference solving, planning, and, it, and they can communicate about this. And Today we're solving uh, cataloging images and, uh, and retrieving them, and uh, as well as static knowledge. And tomorrow it will be about videos and sound. Um, so we're indexing all this knowledge, all this data, and we can do amazing things with, with that. And what we're doing is we're using it for interaction. Um, so uh, because we have an understanding of natural language, we can understand what the user ask, is asking when he interacts with, with the devices. Uh, we can plan and, and uh, predict what the user is doing. And uh, we, with these general plans and, and general uh, ideas of, of, um, of, making, uh, of using constraints, we can apply them to specific users because we know them. Um, so AI is awesome. But it leads to something. It leads to hubris. Um, AI knows better. It, it knows better than you. Uh, and um, it's a real problem because uh, when, AI, uh, when the AI actually knows better, it's cool. When it doesn't, we're, we feel very bad. We are very angry and we, and we react uh, very powerfully against AI. Uh, why? Well, it's because there's no interaction. What is interaction? Interactivity is um, uh, designer Chris Crawford defines interactivity as a psychic process in which two actors alternatively listen, speak, no, listen, think, and speak. Um, what is interesting in this um, definition is that it doesn't differentiate between the machine and the human. Um, they, they both have the same role in the interactivity. But that's obviously not how it works in, in real life. Uh, in real life, the machine has much more power over the interaction. Um, and uh, oh, well, because the reason is <laughs> that um, when there is a failure, the cost is high. So you don't want the interaction to fail. So what you do, you take control. And you chide the user when he's doing something wrong. Bad, bad, bad user. Um, and, and so instead of having this loop, of interaction, you have something like this, uh, which is the machine does this thinking, and the user, well, is on for the ride and can only perceive what's going on and react to what's going on. Um, so when you're using an ATM, well, you're not interacting with an ATM, you're playing out a script, and you have some protocols to go along with the script or go back, but there's no interaction here. You're, you're doing what the machine tells you to do. And, and when you intera you interact with apps and, and machines uh, all day long, and when we want to make plans to, to use them, it's like this. We're with the tree. We're the tree, and we want to get through the fence, and, uh, and we have to twist ourselves <laughs> to find how to have these, work, these apps work together to do something. But, it, but it's not going to change uh, unless somebody actually works uh, on this, because the problem is not technical. The problem is cultural. And now I'm going to uh, go over 65 years of uh, information and uh, communication technology in less than two minutes. So hold on to your seats to explain why it's the case. So this is Claude Shannon, and he invented the information uh, theory. Um, and uh, 
in the idea of information is about transferring from a source to a receiver information, uh, but the, the goal of this transfer is to change the receiver. You issue a command and you change the receiver. Uh, and this is called performative um, communication. You communicate to change the receiver. Um, and this is what, uh, on this principle that technology is built, the reason we have bits or transistor in this machine is because of channel. So everything is built on this principle. And, and the way we interact with computers is thinking like this, about comments and performative actions. Um, and some, some uh, sociologists call this uh, a telegraphic communication. But in real life, that's not how it works. Humans don't use one channel. They use many channels. Um, Irving Goffman calls this orchestral communication. Um, and uh, these channels don't carry just content and performative comments. They carry metacommunication. And metacommunication is part of communication that is not about the content. And it's many more times uh, bigger than content. Uh, actually, most of what we do in life is about metacommunication. Meta when you communicate with somebody, it's about um, establishing power relationship, uh, saying that we are angry, flirting, uh, irony. And, and the problem is, um, we, all this, we can't ignore these channels because uh, when we communicate with people, we are always, where we're in the presence of people, I mean, we're always better communicating. Uh, Ray Borg's whistle calls this involvement. We cannot not communicate in a, at the meta communication level. Um, even uh, staying silent and in a corner is communicating something uh, at the meta level. Uh, so we have to learn. We have to learn what. Uh, what we sort of call the context, the rules, uh, the rituals of interaction, uh, and the rituals of communication, so that we can fit uh, in this uh, in, in society. Um, and uh, the analogy that Bert, Bert Whistles uses is: um, you understand meta communication when you stop uh, looking uh, at the content, just as you understand basketball when you stop watching the ball. Um, so, communication. Uh, as uh, Goffman says, is the performance of culture. We have all these rituals, and these rituals, uh, we, we play out these rituals because that's how we show that we are part of culture. And the greater, the greater purpose of communication is to reassure all these participants that they belong to the same culture. Where we have all these scripts that, that uh, are part of our lives, and, uh, and we play them out because that's how we uh, show that we are in society. And culture, the sum of everything is everything we, we need to belong. And, and um, Bert Wissel says that belonging is being predictable. This is the whole goal. We have to be predictable, otherwise we, we frighten people. So, um, Gottman says that if we do, if we frighten people, if somebody is unpredictable, we try to impose uh, our own rules upon him, so that we make him predictable. That's why you scold the children when he does something wrong, or why you shun people when they, they don't conform to your expectations, or why, why we put people in prison when everything else uh, mm -hmm. has failed. Uh, so back to, uh, to the computer. Uh, the computer has the power, and uh, when something goes wrong, he has to make uh, us predictable, because he has the power. Uh, and, and that's why he's doing that. He doesn't care about us, he wants us to be totally predictable. Uh, and that's how we end up like this. So, is there a way out? Uh, well, yes. Uh, yeah. And, um, and so the, this talk is entitled Beyond the Pale. Okay? Beyond the Pale means uh, beyond the uh, white picket fence. Uh, and the white picket fence uh, symbolizes the place where you're predictable. You're inside the culture. And we believe it. Because outside, outside is scary. Outside, uh, um, you're, you're doing uh, weird things that people in the culture don't recognize as valid. But outside is awesome. Uh, I mean, the first time I saw this picture, I didn't realize that, well, peacocks were birds and they flew. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and AI can, can do that. It can, it can go beyond the, what we know and, and, and bring us um, not uh, in, into the realm of uh, um, 
making people unpredictable, but into the realm of predicting them, understanding them. And, and so we have this stack, but, but it's not a full stack. And, and I'm very uh, honored to be speaking here at SwiftKey uh, uh, tonight, uh, because um, I, I believe that SwiftKey is solving the, the problem the right way. Uh, SwiftKey is a big inspiration uh, of ours at, at Free.ai. Um, and we, you know, when we start, when we talk about uh, vision, strategy, or, or user experience, we, we talk about SwiftKey a lot. Um, SwiftKey um, solved the problems by, by understanding the, the user. Um, that problem is it's the same as as everybody else's. This is this is broken, totally broken, and broken on purpose. Uh, the keyboard was was designed this way because um, the, the designer didn't want people to type fast because otherwise the arms would get uh, jammed. And so we, we're inheriting this keyboard uh, from, from decades ago uh, that is designed on purpose to be, to be inefficient. Um, and so Swifty solved the problems by, by knowing the user and not having hubris, uh, saying, okay, I'm guessing that it's this, but maybe it's not really what you need. And, and you can give feedback. And, and when you start using uh, Swifty, um, you, your behavior changes because trust builds uh, with, with your software. And you can type weird things, trusting that uh, Swifty will understand. And you can give feedback, and, you can, and, and it's very interesting. So what, what Swifty, Swifty is doing from the bottom uh, of the stack, we're, we're doing from the top. Uh, what we want to do is understanding what the user wants why it's accessing an app, why it's doing an action, and how we can help it. Um, we want to close the loop. And the way we're doing that, we, we are following the, the, um, the teachings of uh, Jean Piaget and Simon Favre and many others, but, but these two um, worked on uh, constructionism, which is how do you learn? How do you learn new things? You don't learn by, by learning a set of abstract uh, rules uh, that are arbitrary, which, which is how our computers work. Um, you work when you're in a safe, <coughs> trusting environment where you can experiment without uh, the cost of failure being high, and when you have feedback uh, uh, on, the, on what you're doing. And um, this is how they built a logo, uh, the, the programming language. Um, so this is my uh, definition of interactivity. Um, and, and our guiding principle. It's the process by which two actors build models of one another in order to influence each other's behavior. Again, uh, we are treating two actors as equals. So I realize I, I'm, I'm quoting myself, but well, I work in AI, <laughs> so that's fine. <laughs> um, so the user sheds a lot of information about, about uh, his desires, his, his wishes, his, his intentions. Um, and we can analyze, analyze it and understand it better. But, but as I'm saying, it's a two-way street. Um, so the goal is also to open up the black box and understand why uh, uh, a machine, a program, uh, is thinking the way it does and moving from the what, what are you doing, the common, the performative action, and to the how about the plans, to why, why are you doing this, or why are you reacting, or why are you proposing me this, uh, choice, uh, you, or why are you practicing this for me? Um, uh, so that's that's our guiding principle and and our, our, our dream. And I hope I have convinced you uh, of this uh, that we can fix interactivity with with AI. And uh, if um, if I have, well, uh, that's sore. And uh, contact me after this. Thank you.